Welcome to the third episode of Altevita Talent Mobility Series. My name is Karolina Saviova, and I'm the co-founder and COO of Altevita, the global and cloud-based corporate housing platform powering talent mobility at scale. I'm absolutely thrilled to welcome Jason Will, who is the country manager for China with the Asian Tigers Group. He has an impressive career in relocation and mobility businesses and has lived and worked in China, Singapore, and Indonesia. The Asian Tigers Group is Asia's leading moving company that has been providing moving and relocation services locally and internationally for over 25 years. In today's episode, we'll be, of course, focusing on mobility in emerging markets, particularly in China and Indonesia. Now, Jason, over to you. Please do share with us your story and how did you get to the relocation sector? Thanks. Uh, well, firstly, appreciate the invitation to, uh, to join this call. Um, delighted to, uh, to be on it. Um, my career in the, the mobility or, or moving industry started a long time ago. It was 24 years ago in Australia, actually. Um, I then moved to Indonesia for three years, then uh, Shanghai for three years, then Singapore, back to Indonesia, and then came back to Shanghai over three years ago now. That sounds like a really interesting story. Could you tell us how did you feel during your first posting in Jakarta? How was it? Certainly Indonesia as a place to live. I mean, you've, Jakarta itself is a big uh, city, something like 24 million people. It's, it's not a pretty city. It's, uh, uh, traffic's bad and pollution can be bad. But uh, Indonesia as a country, it's, it's, it's a very diverse uh, it's got 17,000 islands, including, of course, Bali. So you never far away from beaches and um, mountains and, and things. So it's, it's definitely a, a, a destination for tourists um, and an interesting place to be. Uh, so living in Indonesia wasn't, wasn't a, a challenge. <laughs> uh, cost of living is reasonable. Um, they did have an expat boom many years ago, with the, but when the oil price went down, then um, a lot of expats uh, got uh, got relocated elsewhere. So um, the days of, of big expat numbers in uh, Indonesia and Jakarta aren't, aren't there anymore. But uh, I certainly enjoy that was my my uh, introduction to to living in Asia um, and you know the ex expat community. So it was definitely a good starting point for me. Jason, and now you're based in in Shanghai. And could you tell us a bit more about your current role as the country manager for China with the Asian Tigers Group? So, Asian Tigers' uh, footprint in China is, is quite big. We have uh, eleven offices around China. China is obviously a big country, so we need that coverage to cover all the different uh, parts of China. Uh, we have something like three hundred staff around China. Uh, obviously, Shanghai is the, the biggest. Uh, that's where I'm based. The biggest location because that's where the Shanghai is where the largest expat population uh, is based. Um, and then Beijing and Guangzhou, and then smaller uh, second tier, third tier cities after that. So, uh, so it's quite a contrast to, to living in Jakarta and to moving to Shanghai is quite a contrast uh, for sure. Even with its difficulties, it sounds like a very adventurous journey. I would be interested now, in hearing your thoughts about Chinese relocation landscape and the ease of processes for international companies when sending employees to China, and perhaps how this has evolved with the current pandemic. Sure. Um, I'll talk probably pre-COVID, uh, yeah. firstly. Um, I mean, China has always been a popular destination for multinational companies. Obviously, the, the economy um, is, is a large economy, um, 1.3 billion people. Um, and you know, once upon a time, the labor costs were quite cheap in, in China as well, but um, not so much now. Uh, the, the, they've gone up quite a quite a bit. But uh, so multinational companies have been coming into China for you know uh, probably 20, 20 or so years, um, and they're still coming in. Um, they're still looking at uh, China as an attractive destination. Just you know, as the middle class in China uh, increases percentage wise. Um, the Chinese consumers spending uh, a lot of money. Um, there's a lot of wealth here. So it's an attractive market for uh, all types of uh, Western brands, uh, whether you're talking about uh, handbags like Hermes or uh, even Tesla's uh, build a factory in Shanghai. Um, the electrical vehicle purchase 
uh, purchases in China are up 50% year on year. So uh, it's uh, certainly pre-COVID, it was an attractive destination for multinational companies. Um, and now if you look at the current situation uh, with, with COVID, the Chinese economy is um, rebounding quickly. Um, it's recovered. Um, it's probably one of the few countries that's going to have a growth rate um, overall this year. So uh, I don't think China's changed much in terms of being an attractive place for companies to, to set up. And we're certainly seeing that in the global mobility uh, scene. We're getting new inquiries coming in from existing multinational companies and, and also new multinational companies as well, um, who are looking at uh, bringing people uh, in. Um, of course, the challenges at the moment is that to a certain extent, the borders are still locked. Um, there is foreigners coming, coming in. Um, but that hasn't opened up fully. So uh, I know there's a lot of companies that are planning to move people into China, um, but they have to make sure the timing is right when it comes to getting um, work permits and, and visas as well. Um, I would say it's been a, it, it is somewhat bureaucratic when it comes to paperwork. The, the, the visa process is, is not so simple. Um, so there is a lot of paperwork and setting up licenses with companies uh, and, and so forth. So there are some challenges with companies coming into China. You have to have people on the ground who understand the process and what needs to happen. Um, so I think, um, so again, it's quite important. But uh, so the plans are for expats to start coming back into China, but it's, it's only a trickle at the moment. Mm -hmm. And when do, you, when do you think that the remobilization is really bound to happen? For China? It's, it's they're slowly opening market by market. So basically, uh, wherever your company is located in China, you have to get the local district to approve um, your company bringing in expatriates. Uh, some districts uh, are more uh, cooperative than, than others. Um, but they're, they're doing it country by country. So they've opened up to G German uh, Germany at the moment, Korea, um, Singapore. So you know, different markets, but of course the Chinese government is also looking at reciprocation as well. So if you're allowing uh, Chinese citizens to enter your country, then uh, we'll be a lot more cooperative about uh, the, the reverse. Mm -hmm. I see. And when you would compare uh, the, the relocation environment to Indonesia, what you were experiencing there and the challenges you faced, how would, it, how would you compare both markets? Uh, certainly Indonesia, uh, was probably some sense easier, even just from the, the you know, the language barrier is not as strong. Uh, the language barrier is uh, quite strong here. Um, so Indonesia itself, that is still quite bureaucratic in terms of getting work permits and, and visas. It's not a simple process. It takes some, some time. Um, but the process itself in terms of people uh, finding uh, accommodation, schooling um, was, uh, is quite easy. Uh, one of the challenges that companies have with, with the China market is the cost of living here. So having expatriate, the cost of uh, apartments or houses is quite expensive. I think Shanghai is uh, ranked as the seventh most expensive city in the world. Um, and the cost of schooling, uh, international schools, is quite expensive. Well, so it's become an expensive destination. Um, so that's obviously an issue for companies to consider you know, uh, sending expatriate to uh, Shanghai or Beijing, uh, accommodation, schooling, there's significant costs. Whereas Indonesia, uh, it, it's, not as, it's not as expensive. So that's kind of contrast between, uh, you know, the consideration of moving expats into uh, China versus Indonesia. Mm -hmm. And could you tell me a bit more about the expat life in, in both countries? Uh, do you get a sure. big expat community in Shanghai or in Jakarta? Yeah, Jakarta's not as big as what it used to be. Um, it's certainly a lot smaller uh, in comparison, particularly to, to Shanghai. Um, but it's a lifestyle place. I mean, of, of course, you know, the city of Jakarta is... They, they haven't got much infrastructure there. They've only put subways, uh, two subway lines in, in the last uh, year or so. Um, so, you know, as a destination for families, the consideration is uh, there's pollution in Jakarta. Getting around is difficult. But you get, uh, for a reasonable rental sum, you can get a nice house with a backyard and a pool. Um, there's leisure activities, there's golf courses, and then of course you jump on a plane, you can, you can be in a, a beach somewhere, a beach resort somewhere. So 
it still remains an attractive destination for families for those reasons. Uh, but certainly Shanghai is much, much larger uh, expatriate community. So that means that, you know, it's very easy to meet expatriates. It's very easy. Every weekend there's, or every week there's events, uh, whether it's art events or stand-up comedy or uh, outside festivals. So Shanghai, just I think from the, the number of expats that live in Shanghai, is uh, expat friendly. Um, and now, of course, with, the, with, with, with your phones, you've got a lot of apps which you have uh, can communicate, you're in WeChat groups with other expatriates. So when someone's got a question, how do I do this, how do I do that? They post in the group and, and they get answered. You use your phones for ordering Uber, uh, which is called Diddy here. You use your phones for making payments or transfers at a restaurant or even a, a corner store. So I think the, the advent of the, uh, all these apps has made living in a place like uh, China, whereas before, you know, language is an issue, but now if you get a, a message in Chinese on your phone, you hit a button and you get things translation. So um, that's made it uh, a lot easier for uh, expatriates living in China as well. Mm -hmm. It still sounds like you really need to know which, what are the, the local apps and, and the services to, to really use. So I guess that the orientation uh, yes. and really comes yeah. handy. It, in fact, uh, because I've found the same thing when I came back here, through, when I lived here before and uh, 2001, 2003, there was no apps. So when I came back here three and a half years ago, it took me probably six months to figure out what were the apps that were useful and which ones I, sh I should download and, and uh, have on my phone. So as a consequence of doing that, I actually put together a um, app guide for Shanghai. So when we have new arrivals coming in, we give them the guide, they scan the QR codes and it's straight away. Over. So my six month learning process uh, it can be condensed to when people first arrive, the first day they're here, they can get all the apps on their phone that they'll find useful. So uh, that's been very popular. That's amazing. I think that it also came handy, especially during this time, so people know how to order grocery at home, for example, without having to go out. Amazing. The uh, delivery services here. So if you're sitting at home mm -hmm. and you realize you run out of milk um, through your phone, you can order it, you can pay for it. And normally within 20 minutes to half an hour, it could get delivered to you. So it's, uh, it's pretty impressive. Yeah. You don't need to go to supermarkets anymore in, in, uh, in Shanghai. It is impressive for such a large city, indeed. And um, how did the, the expat life actually change with COVID? Can you still go out or what is the current situation? Yeah, of course, it, it hit China uh, earliest. So, um, you know, we, we did have a period there where uh, everybody was working from home. Um, it wasn't necessarily in, enforced by the government, but um, you know, so people are got, you know are very compliant. Uh, people were wearing masks, uh, and as the number of cases decreased, and of course, what they did with Wuhan, they locked down the whole city for mm -hmm. I think almost two months. So uh, the Chinese government's handled the uh, the COVID quite well. Uh, it helps that the the Chinese people are, uh, you know obviously listen to the government and follow what they tell them to do. So uh, in a country the size of China, 1.3 um, billion people, the number of new cases per day is, is, is a handful. It might be 20 or something like that. And a lot of those are uh, people coming in from overseas, what they call imported cases. So, so life was shut down for a while and, and, and people were working from home. And then as things improved uh, now, uh, there's very few people that are working from home. Most people go into the office using the subway um, the difference being most people wearing masks in crowded places, but the, even now people you know, walking down the street stop wearing masks. So China's recovered uh, quite well and, and life is, is, is mostly back to normal. This uh, is the new remobilization, like you've mentioned earlier. We actually know that multinational companies are often facing difficulties retaining employees or even getting employees to accept an assignment in China. So what would you recommend to talent mobility pra practitioners in order to enhance the employee well-being and really encourage them to take the assignment? Sure. Well, of course, China is, 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 is China. It's culturally very different than Western countries. So uh, I think some companies are good at selecting the right type of person for an expat assignment in, in, in China. Um, not everybody uh, is going to feel comfortable 
living in a very different environment where it's different languages and, and uh, at play. Um, so I think that the, the, the need to choose uh, not just the assignee, but the, the, uh, the spouse as well. Um, they have to have a little bit of a sense of adventure. Um, I know expats that love the China experience. They, they live in a lane house with uh, all the neighbors being Chinese and they're really embracing the, the experience of a different culture. Um, but you have to have the right personality uh, for that. Uh, I know other expatriates have come in and found uh, you know, either the signee or the spouse or both. Um, I don't want to live here. This is not what I'm used to. I don't know how to do things. Um, and and then leave. So of course we all know the cost of a failed assignment is, is very expensive. So so I think you know in the selection process about you're not just looking at the competency of the uh, of the assignee, but would they embrace living in a different culture, uh, l learning the language, um, uh, you know, a sense of adventure, I, I guess you'd say, and and embracing a different culture. So so the selection process is is critical. Um, uh, and that's something that um, global mobility people need to keep that in mind. Mm -hmm. Got it. And in terms of your clients, would you be actually more uh, working for solo corporate travelers relocating or uh, like you've mentioned families, what would be the percentage that uh, you're actually seeing? Well, typically the global mobility, uh, typical rotations of, of expats coming into China, leaving China, that probably accounts for probably 70% or normally accounts for 70, 80% of the, our business. Um, it's a little bit different at the moment because there's a lot of expatriates that have been uh, locked out of China. Uh, they left uh, here in end of January for Chinese New Year holidays to their home country or somewhere else. Um, and they set it out. And then when China closed the borders at the end of March, uh, they haven't been able to get back in. So they're sitting over, overseas and they're spending, you know, 20, 30,000, uh, sorry, uh, $3,000, $5,000 a month uh, on a, an apartment, uh, which they're not living in. So actually for the last probably one or two months, the bulk of our business has been foreigners living or, or being caught out and, and uh, stuck overseas. We're getting the shipment through the apartments packed up, uh, either put into storage or, or shipped to where they are. They've, uh, they've got other jobs overseas now um, and they're moving. So, so typically uh, the multinational global ability rotation of expats has been our main market, but the last probably two or three months, it's families that have been locked out of China. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. And uh, now that we spoke a lot about the international moves, I, uh, I know that uh, the Asian Tigers group is also big on, uh, on local relocation. So could you tell us a bit more about the dynamics of the domestic moves and what are the main drivers? Sure. Um, well, of course, Shanghai is the, the, the big expat market, Beijing to, to some extent, but obviously Beijing is the capital. Uh, there's a lot of companies based there, but the, the, the Chinese government is encouraging uh, companies to set up factories, not in the main cities. They want um, uh, industry to be thriving all over China, uh, or Western China. So the government is very active in trying to uh, give incentives to companies to set up factories um, in regional uh, China, or of course, second and third tier cities. So we're seeing more and more of that. Um, again, it's a little bit challenging. Um, just if, if you are an expat and you have a work permit in uh, for working in Shanghai and you move to a new city, you have to get a, apply for the whole new work permit, the whole process again. So we're seeing more and more uh, domestic relocation, um, not just expatriates, obviously Chinese um, uh, nationals as well. In fact, that's always been a thing that uh, multinational companies have been taking uh, some of the Chinese management in China, uh, post them overseas for two, three, four, uh, five or more years to get some additional experience with the company, get to understand the company culture uh, better, and then bring them back to uh, to China in a more senior management role. So that's probably accounts for probably, you know, 30% of our relocations are uh, Chinese nationals or uh, Chinese who've been born or educated overseas coming back into China uh, to take senior management roles. Mm -hmm. And would you see a particular increase uh, in terms of movements to a, to a particular region? Um, yes, there is hot spots. Uh, for example, uh, Shenzhen, which is a city uh, north of Guangzhou in the south of China, 
um, is trying to, and, and China's trying to promote it as the next, or China's Silicon Valley. And they're making centers for um, talented uh, expatriates and companies to set up there. So that's um, that's a hot spot at the moment, um, uh, with a lot of uh, foreigners and companies moving into Shenzhen. Uh, but it varies. So from time to time, um, you know, they'll promote a different region, for example. So, uh, but Shenzhen has probably been the one that's been the hot spot uh, in recent years. Mm -hmm. And uh, you've mentioned that the government's, of course, incentivizing the companies to, to move around, set up, set up new uh, offices and, and locations. Is there a particular industry uh, that would be moving? Is it, for example, manufacturing or what would it be? Of course, China is looking to be self-sufficient in, in many things. So, uh, you know, whether that's building their own uh, airplanes, um, they're encouraging, obviously, the car companies to, to manufacture vehicles inside of China. Um, they, they obviously want to be less reliant on imported products. So technology is a big thing for them. They want um, uh, and incentivizing um, expatriates who uh, work for multi uh, you know, Fortune 500 companies or um, graduated from good universities to, to come in and, and bring um, uh, information technology, um, um, you know, any any technology things that which can be you know, made in in China versus uh, imported. So, so the Chinese government is aware that they need uh, foreign talent. They do need, do need foreign uh, technology. So, um, they're definitely been pushing that. Mm -hmm. Definitely sounds like a exciting and and very dynamic sector to to be in. Uh, what do you enjoy? the most in, in your career? Uh, China's been uh, a great experience for me just because of the size of the market, the, the size of the, the market in Shanghai, the size of the, the expat market in, in China. So it's definitely um, a, a, has been a hot spot, uh, still is a hot spot for multinational companies. You know, obviously the, um, uh, the trade uh, difficulties between China and US, uh, everyone thought that um, multinationals would be moving their uh, operations elsewhere in Asia. It's happened to some companies, but um, not to the extent that, uh, because they realize that, you know, the China market is, is so big and it's on its own right, they need to be on the ground here. So um, so it's been a, fa it's a fascinating uh, place to live, um, you know, in terms of a working environment. Um, you know, the Chinese nationals are, are hard workers. Uh, they want to be successful. So, um, so it's, it's been a great, uh, great experience. I'm looking forward to many more years here. Fantastic. I have just one last question and that would be, uh, what, what is your vision for the future global mobility in, in China, despite the trade war negotiations at the current pandemic sounds like the brighter, it sounds like the future sounds rather bright. <laughs> yes, everyone's asking what will be the new normal global mobility, uh, obviously on a global basis, um, it's really hard to say. Um, we're not seeing the impact on China yet because we're seeing multinationals planning uh, uh, for the expatriates to, to move to China. Uh, they're planning to be here. Um, there has been some downsizing of, of the expat population. So, you know, uh, a company will, that has 10 expats will, for cost reasons or otherwise, will, will maybe uh, downgrade that to, to six or seven. But it's such a big market for uh, expatriates and multinational companies. So it's always going to be busy. So we're not seeing any impact of, of, of COVID in the local market. It's probably other countries that have been affected in different ways, but um, we're expecting that it's business as usual. Uh, you need to be on the ground here. You need to have expatriates on the ground here. So uh, business as usual. All right. Thank you so much for your time. My pleasure. Thanks for having right. me.